Okay, welcome here everybody. Digitally and, and here in the room, we have many people here. RISE is Sweden's research institute. We have 3,000 or more than 3,000 people, I think, working on a wide array of topics. Uh, and the computer science department works on applied AI research projects for the benefit of society. And we organize these amazing seminars every week. Uh, so, so this meeting will be recorded. And if anyone wants to be removed from this recording, including the speaker, you just let us know. We have a number of, of great talks recorded. Uh, for example, the one made by, by Sarah Beery, who's in the room here today, uh, one year ago. It's on our YouTube channel, so please check that out. Uh, but today, I have the pleasure to introduce to you Nico Lang, who is a postdoc at the University of Copenhagen, and who's here today in, in Lund, in our office. He's with the Pioneer Center for AI, and he's supervised by Serge Belonghi and, and Christian Eagle there. Uh, Nico defended his PhD at ETH Zurich in, in 2022, supervised by Professor Konrad Schinder and, and Professor John Dick Beckner. Uh, he's there been working on, on uh, fusing op optical satellite images with, with space-borne LiDAR, and, and some of his research now Includes, includes working on uncertainty quantification for these kinds of, of models with this kind of data. And the topic uh, for the talk today is global vegetation monitoring uh, with probabilistic deep learning. And with that said, Nico, please, thank you. the floor is you. Great, so um, it's so nice to be here uh, today physically. Uh, I know this is a virtual seminar going on in the Thanks everyone for join, joining uh, remotely, but I'm very happy that we made this de decision that I just crossed the bridge and come over from Copenhagen. Um, yeah, thanks for the kind introduction and the invitation overall. Today I will talk about uh, global vegetation monitoring with different sensors, different remote sensing sensors. Uh, yeah, it's, it's mainly work that I did during my PhD. Uh, although I'm still uh, very interested in this topic, I will mainly talk about three projects that I did during my PhD. Okay, so why are we actually that interested in mapping vegetation? Uh, as we all know, hopefully, is that forests provide very important ecosystem uh, services, right? So for instance, it's estimated that about 80% of terrestrial species do live in forests. Hi everyone, Hi. welcome. Uh, and then an another strong ability of forests is to absorb and store carbon, uh, which is one of the, the very interesting aspects here. So, because of that, uh, the United Nations have formulated these global forest goals. We uh, cannot see the slides. You cannot see the slides? Yes, okay. slides. I mean, uh, we can see you, but uh, slides are not visible. The slides yeah. are shared. I can see the slides. Yeah, okay, maybe I can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but no. thanks for uh, letting us know. Yeah. Let is me the audio see. okay? Can you, the audio is fine? Yeah, audio is fine. Yes. Great. There's probably some way of switching between the, the, the camera view and, and the slide view. If you, if you yeah, know. that's what I'm figuring out. Yes. All right. Because, yeah, I can side. see now. Yeah. Yeah, I can see now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, one forest goal is to increase the forested area uh, by about 3%. Uh, between 2017 and 2030. And a second goal is to maintain and even enhance the carbon that is stored in forests. So these are ambitious goals and they are um, related to two global challenges. One is to mitigate climate change and the other one is to avoid biodiversity collapse. And now two 
actually monitor if we make progress towards these goals, we need data and that data should ideally be global, high resolution and predictive of these uh, quantities that we want to measure, especially uh, carbon stocks. And that's where vegetation height comes in as one of the key indicators that are used to estimate carbon stocks uh, at larger scales. So one problem is that collecting this data in the field can be rather challenging and thus for obvious reasons, not scale to large areas. Like for instance, this picture where uh, two climbers try to measure some data about this sequoia tree. It's clear that this uh, is a very time consuming and maybe dangerous task. So how do we measure vegetation height today? Uh, unfortunately, there's no single sensor available yet that can provide exactly the data that we want, but there's a range of different sensors where we have to make uh, some decisions. So either we get very high quality data from laser scanning instruments, either on the ground or from airborne uh, campaigns, um, or we can nowadays put these laser scanners into space, which helps us to cover much larger areas, but the quality is not as good as if we do this on the ground. Uh, and then finally, we also have other sensors that provide, for instance, optical images that are clearly not designed to measure forest structure or carbon stocks. But there are pros and cons. And as we move to the left, we could say the suitability for measuring vegetation structure is lower and lower, but the scalability goes up. Um, so how can we combine all this data? And that is actually maybe uh, a reason why we should reformulate this question is not how to measure vegetation, right? how to estimate it. And that is where deep learning and machine learning can play an important role to bring all these different data sets together. Okay, so as I already mentioned, I will talk about three projects. Uh, so this is the overview. So first we will talk about uh, how Sentinel-2 optical images from, uh, from ESA can be used to map vegetation height. Then we will have a look at the JEDI mission, which is operated by NASA, which is a, a space-borne laser scanner. And then the last chapter will be how to combine exactly these two uh, sensors to map vegetation height at a global scale. So let's start with the, the first part. And I don't know who is familiar with Sentinel-2 in this room. Some people, yeah. Let me cover this very briefly. So it's a multispectral sensor. That means uh, we get RGB channels, but also near infrared uh, and other wavelengths. So in total, we have about 12 bands that we can use uh, for modeling. And the, the huge advantage of this sensor is that you have global coverage and you get an image at least every five days, which is quite nice that even in uh, frequently clouded regions, you can get a, a cloud-free observation at some point. Um, so when I started my PhD and uh, attended the Living Planet Symposium organized by ESA for the first time, I talked to several remote sensing experts and talked about our plan to map vegetation height from optical images. And I usually heard that, oh no, that's not possible. We don't understand this relationship, how to actually design features to estimate vegetation height from, from optical images. And so that's where a data-driven approach, given reference data, from example, uh, airborne lighter campaigns, uh, can play a role. And we simply approach this by learning the features uh, and the regression model end to end from reference data. So formulating this as a supervised learning problem by minimizing some loss function like the mean squared error 
can lead to, or hopefully can lead to predictive features to estimate canopy height. Uh, maybe to briefly mention, the goal is actually to estimate canopy height for every pixel, so for every 10 by 10 meter pixel. Uh, to carry out this study, we collected reference data from two countries, so from Switzerland, from our peers at WSL, and then also from a tropical country in Gabon, where uh, the Elvis NASA campaign made all the data publicly available, which is really nice uh, for doing research on this topic. So to understand a bit better what this model is capable of and, and whatnot, we carried out some ablation studies to first of all better understand um, the effect of the different input bands. As I mentioned, there are 12 input bands. Some of these bands, the RGB and near infrared, come at the 10 meter resolution. Other bands are at 20 or 60 meter resolution. For our purpose, we always upsample everything to get a 10 by 10 meter data cube. Um, but what we can see here is actually that, so in the column, in the first column, we see the overall error measured as the mean absolute error. Then we see the error for different height bins, 10 meter height bins. So the RGBN bands, the, the truly 10 meter resolution bands seem to be most important for this task and can actually perform very similar to using all the bands. So there's not much to gain from adding all the other bands for this task. And missionary invert. Yeah, exactly. And then the second ablation study, so we had this discussion before, is, is it actually worth to learn textual features with the CNN? Um, or could we simply treat this as a pixel to pixel mapping and just look at the spectral signature of a pixel. And it turns out when you now compare uh, the last row with the first row, that performance drops quite significantly and especially um, for the very high canopies, yeah? Did you control for a number of parameters? Yes, we tried so in terms of depth and non-linearity. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, it's a- It's a little tricky. Yeah, it's tricky. But we, we get, gave our best to make these experiments comparable. Yeah. yeah, so conclusion was that texture actually is useful for this task. Uh, yeah, so we then tried to see if we can deploy these models because in the beginning it felt a bit bulky to have such a, let's say at that time, expensive modeling approach and we produced this countrywide map. And here's just an example how this looks like if you compare it to a one kilometer map. So there's definitely some structure that you gain by modeling this at a 10 meter resolution. And this is a very interesting region here in Gabon, which uh, is Pongara National Park, which has the tallest mangroves in the world where they reach heights above 60 meters and our model managed actually to, to capture some of this uh, in the predictions while previous models couldn't do that. And then the same for Switzerland. So yeah, to conclude this line of work or preliminary study was that it seems that Sentinel-2 is actually useful to map canopy height uh, and that uh, the commonly observed problem of saturating at higher canopies can sort of be circumvented by modeling textural features. Yeah. Another question. Um, how did you take elevation into account? Elevation? Yeah. We don't. You don't at all. Yeah. So you just you're just predicting height directly? From the optical. From elements, the optical. Yeah. And and you have no information about like elevation. No. I guess you could think of adding it either as an additional input band. I don't know if it would help. I was just curious. Yeah, no, we didn't. It's purely appearance based. I mean, the height is just, that's just the vegetation effect. So from, from, from ground, the ground, to exactly. Yeah. And another question the height of a, of a 10 by 10 meter area, is that the average height in there? Or... That's a good question. That's a definition 
thing. Yeah. yeah. So what uh, did you do? Uh, do you remember? Actually, we did both here. So in Switzerland, it was mean, and in uh, Gabon, it was max, maximum. Right. What was the reason for that? Like doing a different thing? Um, there was no explicit reasoning in the first place. In the end, it also depends a bit what you want to do with this data later on. And some people found that, for instance, mean canopy height can be more predictive for biomass estimation. But uh, I don't think that there is already conclusive ag agreement on what height metric you actually want to estimate if you're interested in estimating biomass. But well, I guess if, if you do machine learning, you can try to estimate both. Yeah. Both mean and max or yeah, yeah, whatever exactly. of this. Yeah. So, so is it good enough, the kind of estimates that you, that you get? For practitioners or for yeah, real world applications? Measuring or uh, I guess the answer it depends, but uh, we thought it's definitely useful for some downstream applications, especially providing it in a more consistent, large scale way. So yeah, that, that's a good question. But yeah, we thought it's worth to keep working on this and try to extend it to larger scale. But the limiting factor was just that you need reference data. And what we tried at this stage was, for instance, what happens when we take the model trained in Switzerland and apply it in Gabon. And I guess we all can imagine what happens. It doesn't work. So um, you need reference data that is really representative of the areas that you want mm -hmm. to map. So what do we do? Yeah, can I yeah. ask you a question? Sure. So just to understand kind of how hard it has to be. If you would predict, you just guess the height from the neighboring pixel, how large would your average uh, be? If you have the, the height yeah. of the neighboring so pixel. The, the, yeah. yeah the, the, your prediction is the same, the average of the neighboring. Yeah. Good question. Like, um, I have no uh, answer to that yet. Sort of a spatial variogram to yeah, see what's spatial. Um, yeah. Okay. So then during my PhD, I think it was 2019, uh, NASA launched its JEDI mission, which they planned for, I think, more than 10 years. And it finally was mounted on the International Space Station. And that is such a promising mission because it's explicitly designed to measure vegetation height and forest structure um, on a global scale. So we were wondering if data-driven modeling, deep learning can help somehow in the calibration of this mission because the data is still not perfect, not like on a ground or uh, aerial uh, campaign. So to show you, Oh, it's a bit bright, but I hope you see something. This is the International Space Station. And here's this uh, instrument that's the size of a refrigerator. And it shoots laser beams to the ground along eight parallel ground tracks. And then every shot, they're about 60 meters apart along track and 600 meters apart uh, between the tracks you get one of these returns. So you get this vertical profile, which reflects the structure uh, of a canopy. Right? And what we now, we already discussed that, we can, for instance, extract the canopy's top height from this profile if we know where the ground is and the top. Um, but it turned out that it's not so trivial to simply run uh, some mode detections and then take the first and the last node and say this is ground and that's the top because the data is quite noisy for different reasons. But um, yeah, so I already, already mentioned that, right? The data is sparse. It's not like a dense measurement that you would get from an aerial company. And that there are some unknown effects and noise in the data, which we cannot explicitly model yet. Yeah, apparently, yeah, it took quite some time to 
come up with this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we wanted to figure out the potential of deep learning in this calibration task, and also uh, if we can quantify the uncertainty in those estimates. Then uh, that was uh, one of the focus in this in this work. So this is one of these input waveforms uh, that we can get. And let's imagine here's the canopy top and the ground return. We are just interested in this difference. So we do not want to explicitly detect the ground and the top, but we just want to estimate the canopy top height directly. Let's assume we have that pairing of waveform and canopy top reference data. So to model the uncertainty, we reformulate this regression task a little. And instead of just estimating one point, we want to estimate the distribution over the output. And we do this by adding a second output to our CNN. So instead of only predicting the mean, we would also predict the variance um, for every waveform. And we do this by not only optimizing the mean squared error, but optimizing yeah, the Gaussian negative log likelihood. So you see here, we have uh, like the mean estimate and then also the variance estimate, both conditioned on our input, the waveform, and we can optimize for that. And now we do not only do this with a single model, but with an ensemble of model, models that are all trained from different random initializations to then also quantify the model uncertainty here. Can you go, I know, yeah. you have, I've done this kind of thing in the past as well, and you have this complex loss term there. Sometimes you'll see that it optimizes for one portion of it for a while, and then at some epoch mysteriously, it'll yeah. go to another. Did you see that where like, it'll be like, mean is getting better, mean is getting better, mean saturates, now it's time for variance. It's true that there's some numerical Issues going on sometimes. Do right? you know what causes that? I've seen this behavior quite a bit, where there's this yeah. bit implicit loss trade-off within within the, the the structure that you're creating. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I don't think I have seen that exact mm. behavior that you observed, but uh, yeah. So some tricks include, for instance, yeah, adding a small epsilon term to mm. the variance to make things more stable and so on. So. There you have to read the papers rather carefully to get all these tricks or even look at code. Yeah. Is the input the whole way from the learning? Yeah. Or do you do you use like any augmentation of both sort of random? We do sampling. some yeah. waveform augmentations, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's the whole waveform. It's like a one-dimensional array of lengths 1,400. Mm -hmm. So it has like a 15 centimeter resolution between the returns. Okay, yeah, so then we combine the result of these uh, members, model members, to then get our final uh, estimate. So final canopy height and the final predictive uncertainty. And in the literature, this is usually distinguished as something called epistemic or the model uncertainty, which reflects the uncertainty in your parameters. In supervised learning, the uncertainty that comes from a lack of supervision data, and then also the data uncertainty or aleatoric uncertainty, which is something, which is the uncertainty that you cannot train away by collecting more data. It's simply the noise in your data. Uh, in, in satellite, optical satellite observations, that could be, for instance, a cloudy observation. Yeah, so again, a supervised problem. So we got access to this uh, carefully created training data set from the Jedi Science mission team. Uh, so we had access to these 70,000 on orbit waveforms that were matched with uh, airborne laser scanning data. And they even run some optimization to reduce geolocation uncertainty, etc. So it's a very careful created data set that they provided for us. And yeah, so what you get in the end from this vertical profile is something called relative height metrics. So for instance, the RH98 
is the height at which 98% of the energy is returned. And that's usually used as the proxy for the canopy top height. So in a noisy setting, you do not want to use 100 because that could be uh, highly affected by the noise. So that's what we use to estimate canopy top height. And here you see some results. And I think the panel on the right is more interesting. So what happens actually with this estimated uncertainty? What can we do with it? And if we, for instance, start filtering out the most uncertain test samples going from the right to the left, then you see that the overall error is reduced. So these uncertainty estimates actually reflect the data points that are erroneous. And that's the uncertainty in terms of the sigma and the variance that you estimate. Yeah, both actually. So the uncertainty that you get from an ensemble plus the uncertainty that was estimated on every model. Yeah, so we just for demonstration, we run that on the four uh, first months of the mission to see if we can see some global patterns that make sense. And that was sort of confirmed. Um, and that's actually the good news now we have access to globally distributed reference data from Jedi, um, which we can, of course, then use in the approach that I presented in the first part. Um, okay. So this brings me to the final part here. So are there any more questions for part two? Yeah. I guess I would ask, so my background is in Bayesian statistics and it's really interesting now I'm into learning. And so this second paper, which I've actually seen you present before, is funny because it's not quite one or the other. It's sort of a Frankenstein between the two, right? It's a so they're point est their maximum likelihood point estimates of distributions. So do you think we'll ever get to a place where we're closer to estimating a posterior or something kind of like it for the kinds of things you're interested in? Um, obviously, if we went to non-Gaussian processes. That loss function get ever more difficult. In fact, for Poisson, it'd be kind of hard. And so um, you're sort of straddling two different uh, intellectual statistical frameworks. Um, is is that strange to you? Like, how do how do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that I'm not the complete Bayesian expert here, and I also try to avoid any discussions <laughs> when it comes to Bayesian or frequentist views, but. Yeah, I think a big limitation is that we still make assumptions about things being Gaussian, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if, I don't think we understand very well what happens when things are not Gaussian, right? And we, we squeeze it into this parameterization of a mean and the variance, and we have to follow that. I don't know if we should make that more flexible. Um, it would be interesting to hear your Views on that. Yeah, I'll follow up to that. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to model this like a histogram set to sort of have something that's not Gaussian, potentially? Or beams, you have beams instead? Like reinventing calculus, a mixture of Gaussian <laughs> <that> represent <laughs> anything. Or is that problematic in somehow, or do you see that could be sort of a, a approach as well, just changing that and testing? Or is, are there really limitations to doing that, except the beams and the. Yeah. yeah. I guess the challenge there is again, you have to make decisions on how to bin, right? And where do you set the thresholds? Yeah. And but there are, there are papers where they estimate the sort of whole probability without sort of lots of assumptions. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether it would work with this data. I don't know what cases it covers, but they still sort of you know, just blurring it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a tricky discussion. So. If someone has strong opinions about that, I'm happy to hear them now. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess let's move on with the with the third part, where the the idea is to combine these two sensors, Sentinel two and Jedi. So we have these dense optical images with the ten meter ground sampling distance, and then we get the sparse 
observations from Jedi. And we only use the canopy topite from Jedi for now. Um, yeah, the overall goal would be to still create dense canopy height maps. So a canopy height estimate for every pixel. And this is how we approach this. So again, um, Sentinel-2 is our input to a, a CNN. And then we have two outputs now, the mean and the variance. So very similar to the modeling approach used to do waveform interpretation, but now for image interpretation. And then on the right, this is like the Jedi footprints look like. So you get this sparse supervision signal. So for every pixel where we get a Jedi observation, we can optimize a loss function to train this. But it's, it's very different from getting a, a dense supervision signal. Yeah, and then again, we decided to model this with an ensemble that uh, what's a bit special here is that every member of the ensemble at test time would take a different observation, mainly because we anyways have to process multiple images in many regions because a single image cannot provide a full coverage. So the main goal is to provide full coverage, but then also get the, the variance over those, uh, yeah, pixels that have multiple observations. Do you just take every observation that's there, or do you? No. Uh, no. So we have to limit ourselves to process 10 observations per location. How do you choose? Uh, we query uh, the 10 Sentinel tiles with the lowest cloud cover within a year. And which is not the ideal case because these tiles have a 100 by 100 kilometer region, um, but it was the most practical approach for, for that. Yeah, so we use this data set with around 600 million Jedi shots uh, to create this training data set and then split at this sentinel tile level, as I just said, 100 by 100 kilometer region and hold out 20% for validation and the rest for training. So here you see the distribution of the validation regions. Um, yeah, so I think I briefly mentioned the, the problem of underestimation, right? That when we model canopy height from optical images, we often observe that this saturates rather early. And this is how it would look like the residuals. So negative residuals means that the model underestimates the reference data. You see how this goes down uh, as we move to high canopy. So we tried to circumvent that with a three modeling uh, approaches. One first approach that we tried was to include geographical coordinates to allow the model basically to learn where we are on Earth and to learn sort of a geo prior early on. And that slightly improves uh, this underestimation bias. Then we, if we look at the distribution of canopy height uh, in our data set, we see that the, the tall canopies are rather rare. So that we have some imbalance in this data set. So we try to fine-tune the model uh, with a reweighted loss function to give it a bit more importance on, on those high canopies. And then finally, ensembling with five models also helps to improve this performance. Did the ensemble size, did you study that three, seven, five? Yeah. So we chose five yeah. in the end. Um, at that scale, we just did not have the compute to yes. run many, many ablation studies. There is some literature that shows that you can already from five models get something. Um, yeah, no, we didn't study that. Yeah. When I read this paper, one of the things I thought was really interesting is that the ensemble seems to just systematically predict higher, but sometimes, yeah, like what makes you, like what would be causing that? Because even in sort of, it, it, it's getting worse in a higher direction as you ensemble um, in the lower ranges. And I thought that was really interesting. It was like consistently getting over predicting with the ensemble. 
I was curious about your intuition. Yeah. No, I don't really have that intuition. Why is that happening? Yeah. Edit. Yeah, doesn't it prove in some way that it's not an accident? <laughs> <laughs> the details are not the same. Yeah, yeah. Right? If it was, it's just size. It wouldn't look like that. Yeah. Yeah. That could be one explanation. Yeah. That's interesting. So just to understand it, it seems like before you do anything, it seems like you can estimate the lower trees using the weld, and then all the tall trees are more or less estimated as the same height. Is that how I can interpret it? If you have, is a 45 meter tree, is estimated as a 25 meter tree, and a 30 meter tree, it's also estimated as a 25. So it seems to me that as you get the taller trees, they are being estimated as having saturated as the same height. Is that how I should interpret? Yeah, it's right. definitely still a saturation going on, just a bit later than. Yeah. But it, I mean, yeah, without so. these corrections, let's say. Yeah. yeah. It's difficult from the data to see whether it's like a 30 or 40 meter tree. Um, Yeah, I mean, in the end, we look at averages over millions of, of yeah. data points, and then you see a signal, right? But for an individual pixel that tells you 30 meter and another pixel that tells you 40 meter, yeah, yeah I would not. Uh, th that's why we actually model the uncertainty of these pixels, right? To figure out which pixel can we trust more. And ideally, if you get two pixels with 30 meter, estimates but different uh, uncertainty estimates then you would trust of course the one more that has a lower answer but yeah because the s2 only model seems to be better like or like you know s2 plus geo along maybe is like better for shorter trees mm. does it make sense to actually like take the predictions and break it up and then actually use that for the shorter yeah, but you would need an oracle that tells you in which situation should you use which model. But I guess the oracle it doesn't it, like if you just take the predicted height mm -hmm. of both into account and then choose based on that, could you actually get some sort of zombie model that was actually better? Maybe. maybe, <laughs> maybe. So I, I run some addition, uh, like additional um, filtering experiments. I don't have them here on the slides, but what we can do actually is when we filter with some sort of relative uncertainty, if we normalize with the predicted height, and then we start to filter out again by the most uncertain pixels, the first thing that gets uh, removed is actually the, the short trees at uh, the, the low vegetation that is overestimated. So this overestimation goes away when we apply this filtering method. So the uncertainty somehow reflects what's going on in this overestimation part, which is, I think, good news. Yeah. So if you have an application where you really care about not overestimating the low vegetation, then you should actually apply that post-processing using the estimated uncertainty. OK, so then uh, we deployed that to create this uh, canopy height map for the year 2020. Um, yeah, which so I already mentioned that we decided to deploy it for 10 images for every location to get like full coverage. Um, yeah, that's about 160 terabytes of pixels. And here is also the, the corresponding uncertainty map. And you see that, for instance, uncertainty does correlate quite a bit with uh, the canopy height, but not only. So there are also regions that are actually have rather low vegetation height, but rather high uncertainty, like in Alaska. Uh, yeah, so which could be both. So on the one hand, there's uh, Jedi, it's only flying up to these 60 degrees north and south. So if we start to predict beyond Jedi, the model has never seen any supervision uh, for these regions. So that could be epistemic uncertainty. 
but also if there are frequent cloud coverage, we should actually collect and process more than the 10 images to get better coverage. So this is a mixture of effects here. Okay, I think I should speed up a bit. Um, so to finish, I want to show some potential applications that we could think of when we, we get these remote sensed canopy height maps. And one, one thing that we tried was to see how we can, uh, for instance, model above ground uh, carbon densities or carbon stock from this canopy height. And by using some data here in Sabah in uh, Indonesia, we uh, can actually see a decent correlation between the, the two metrics. Um, although you see that as you go to the, the higher canopies, the spread uh, gets much larger. Then another potential application is change analysis. So we could take that model and produce annual maps, for instance, here in California for the year 2019 and the year 2021, and then look at the change between the two. And this is a case where there was a wildfire in 2020. And this change map reflects very well the mapped extent of this wildfire. That we tried for um, like tree cutting activities in the Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a rather that's an easy task if it's really a clear cut. You see that immediately. Yeah, we tried that as well. Um, yeah, and then we already heard a comment before that we can also think about multitasking. And here, my PhD colleague Alex Becker was uh, experimenting with uh, these five different variables that we can automatically extract from airborne data data. So not only canopy top height, which could be like that's like the, the top variable here, the mean height, density, then some other uh, more vertical and uh, horizontal structure metrics. And this also gave very, very uh, promising results. So you can train a single model that does all these jobs uh, in parallel. Uh, yeah, because these things are probably very correlated. So before I finish, I want to point out some limitations of this global map. Uh, and one issue that we observe is that the spatial or the effective spatial resolution of that map is much smoother than the maps that we were able to produce when we train on high resolution dense aerial reference data. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, so the first one is that the footprint of Jeddah is around 25 meter in diameter. And the map actually re reflects the canopy top height within these 25 meters footprints that are centered at every sentinel two pixel. And then the sparse supervision does not allow you to learn the neighboring signal. Um, yeah, and then in the version one data that we used, there was a rather uh, yeah, substantial geolocation uncertainty, which also adds to the smoothing effect. So if you would repeat that with the version one, two data from Jeddah, where they improved the geolocation uncertainty quite a bit, I would expect that exactly the same method would uh, achieve better better resolution. Are the CMNs that you use, are they also using, because you said something about also using uh, geolocation in your training, in your, mm -hmm. in your practice. Yeah. So is that also used there? Because then you can sort of learn that this area of the world, it should be 40 meters. Uh, this area of the world, it should be 20 meters high. Yeah. I mean, the geolocation as an input is more on a course level. Are we in Africa? Are we? Okay, in so it's not like that if you don't do that setup. It is, it is, but I do not really expect from the model to learn by heart that at latitude. So you could learn that in Congo, if there are higher trees. Well, yeah, yeah. If you use that fire, I wonder if it would actually hurt your ability to detect change. Mm -hmm. Because if you teach it that it should be a certain height yeah. in the area and then something changes, like wildfires, and does that? Yeah. 
I think how much was that? I, uh, yeah, I'm curious what was happening. Yeah. We used it for. But the two location error that I'm talking about here is really like which pixel entry. gets which reference data yeah. during the training yeah. and yeah. evaluation, right? Even when we evaluate on Jedi pulled out data, we have these effects in the metrics. Okay, and uh, this is a more recent uh, paper that came out this week is uh, from a colleague here in Copenhagen. See you has been working on this. So um, they they are looking at much higher resolution um, imagery, like three meter planet scope images and applying similar methods to that to estimate canopy height for, for that imagery. And it was interesting that they could actually improve their performance by feeding in the global canopy height map as an additional input band, which I was of course happy to see these results. Uh, yeah, so these are very, it's a promising technique. Um, or approach, but it's of course, again, limited by the availability of uh, high resolution ALS reference data, which is tricky. How can we design such a, a training scheme for a representative global study? Um, and yeah, I think it would also be interesting to think about how we can make better use of the uncertainty that we provide in such a downstream modeling approach. Good, so almost time to finish. Um, this is my last slide. So to conclude, I think Sentinel-2 is really useful for, for canopy height mapping, and we should not forget about the optical images in this task. And of course, this end-to-end -end learning is very promising. And the model uncertainty might not be perfect, but at least can indicate some erroneous pixels and could be used to inform downstream tasks. Um, yeah, so some open research questions that I think could be interesting is in many remote sensing applications, we have these, this problem that we only get sparse supervision, not only in canopy height or vegetation <coughs> structure mapping, but also in, in biodiversity observations, et cetera. So how can we preserve spatial high resolution that we see actually in the image in our predicted output maps? I think that's an interesting task to solve. Um, yeah, and I think now it's time to, to finish here. And these are, I think, all potential uh, applications. This is one I haven't mentioned yet, I think biodiversity modeling can also profit from these uh, vegetation height maps if we manage to really characterize habitats on the horizontal aspect. Yes. So what about <laughs> silent forests, right? Sorry? If, so when, when people talk about using um, tree presence or tree height as a um, biodiversity predictor, mm -hmm. one of the issues that comes up a lot is what this this term silent forest which is basically um things like forests where there is little biodiversity because of often human effects yeah. these are usually planted forests. Yeah. so this is like a big open question i'm curious if you have any thoughts on when tree height might actually be like anti-correlated with biodiversity if that would ever happen yeah yeah i think we need more than just tree height right mm -hmm. and i think what What's key is to get sort of high resolution, dense structure. So yeah. the variation in height mm -hmm. is probably the more promising indicator than just right. looking at absolute <laughs> height, right? Mm -hmm. Although like in a, in a very tall natural forest, you might expect multiple layers of vegetation, but that's not always the case. So yeah. what we would actually like is to get uh, the full vertical profile in a dense way. Mm -hmm. Not only the canopy top height, but really what's going on below the canopy and in the canopy. I agree with you that I think that's really exciting. I just, I just need to see thinking about when is it actually harmful and sort of helpful. I guess trying to figure out how many might help. Yeah. In Google, Doctor, there are some in Zoom that have that is also on this. There's thirty in chat. We, oh. I'm following in the chat, so, mm -hmm. so, so I will bring up if if anyone wants to. 
ask questions. So there's a hand up from Hakim. Mm -hmm. You can ask your question with your mic if you like. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Nikos. Really exciting stuff. Um, I have a more of a uh, remote sensing question than a uh, deep learning question. Mm -hmm. um, so how uh, did you guys deal with shadows? Because I'm looking at your global canopy height from 2020, uh, the Google Earth uh, uh, platform. Yeah. And uh, there is a very nice wide band of high canopy heights um, uh, in the Himalayas. And I zoomed in and a lot of them seem to be shadows. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with the steep uh, topography? Uh, yeah, because the, the optical signal uh, is, is, is sometimes hidden in these shadows. So, yeah. Yeah. So we keep the shadows in the tra training data. Um, so we show the model like these shadow regions and the model has to basically learn to be invariant to these effects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah seems like it's not always successful and still affected by, by that. Um, but that was the, the only decision that we made regarding this uh, challenge. Okay. Uh, and sorry, just... Quantification? Good sorry? question. So can you see it in the uncertainty quantification? Uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, highly uncertain in that, in that part of the world, uh, especially the areas with high topography. Um, and I just have one more follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned yeah. in, in slide 10 uh, that you used uh, texture features. Uh, could you tell us like which texture features, which GLCMs you used in the training? Uh -huh. So yeah, I, I think I skipped all the technical details there. So we use a CNN that just has three by three convolutional kernels. So with this, it is able to learn neighborhood features, right? Uh, and then you stack those three by three kernels. And by doing that, you get a much larger receptive field. So it's not restricted to a three by three neighborhood. So it gets a larger neighborhood. Okay. Um, and, yeah. But do you think, is, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, and, and do you think uh, adding texture features into your global model uh, might uh, improve it. Do you think that's, uh, that's something that you guys are thinking about? So that's what we actually do. So we yeah. train a, a CNN that has these three by three kernels. So the global model can learn textural features. Okay. Or has learned textual okay. features. And any, any, uh, any plans to incorporate Sentinel-1 into this uh, framework? Yeah. So. We had a look at Sentinel-1 uh, in this work. So you could have a look at this paper. Uh, in Norway, we found that there is actually little to gain from adding Sentinel-1 and that most of the heavy lifting is done by the features from Sentinel-2. That okay. could be different for different parts in the world, uh, but that's what we found here in Norway. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so, so if I understand sample resolution correctly, then I guess the shadow depends on the kind of state. Yeah. So if you have different images, you could actually use different shadows and basically make like a sun model, like where the illumination comes from and how the topography is. You can just different input maps. So just like you have kind of the X and Y essentially, you could also get actual light. And you could think of using that then also to sense somehow the density of the forest because maybe the light goes in in a certain way and then this would yeah. keep that a little bit more. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Sentinel 2, for instance, also provides a sun angle layer. So you could directly make use of that. Um, yeah, it was always, uh, uh, so there is also this discussion about using. Uh, augmentations, right? Mm -hmm. Should we rotate our chips, flip them or not? Or put color, put clouds of color. Yeah, or just keep some real cloudy data in your training data. Um, yeah. Um, in the end, yeah, you, you really have to study that on a, on a bit uh, smaller scale. It's tough to study these things on a global scale, but you need a good, data set that reflects different parts of the world that increases in size.
So do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's a really consistent and challenging problem. Like how do you build a small enough that you can reasonably experiment on it, but globally representative data set? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a question of how to sample the world, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how to inform that sampling to get a, a fair bias. Um, I guess all the sampling strategies are imperfect and have their issues. One thing that I, I guess is rather practical would be to use the biomes or even ecoregions to inform that sampling. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the way to do it. There's any value since you've predicted uncertainty in targeted sampling for additional training data. Like if you now you know this uncertainty map for canopy height, should we actually target the areas of uncertainty to fly ALS? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. You would actually want to look at the areas with high epistemic uncertainty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if just your, your uncertainty is high because a specific vegetation structure is not well sensed in an optical image, then it's not really worth to fly more and more. Well, but I meant um, I guess LIDAR. Like yeah, yeah. Oh, but if it's not well sensed, gotcha. Yeah, it's like, if it's just a very hard problem, mm. then uh, maybe it adds a little bit, but. Uh, I'm very inspired by like the very explicit targeted sensing that like the World Meteorological Organization does, for example, where they're constantly building uncertainty estimates for their weather models and then just explicitly paying to deploy sensors and manage sensors in all of these different places. That's like the dream to that for biodiversity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this last slide, uh, we had sort of some future resource directions. Yeah. And the last one there, reduce the amount to need for training data. So I'm, I'm curious if you have some ideas, some experience now that you think maybe this should be tried. If you would help me prioritize, do something, but what would you do? Um, yeah, I mean, there's this big discussion of self-supervised learning uh, and learning general purpose representations. Um, and there I think a promising Direction is definitely to explore multitasking, right? And do different tasks at one once. Ideally, not only tasks that are highly correlated, but that are sort of complementary each other as well. So yeah. And then yeah. So I wasn't gonna ask you about it, but since you brought it up, right? So there is the Facebook group um, who has been making the the through management, I should say. Yeah. That who made the Kathy Height model. Mm -hmm. uh, through self supervision by comparing things and they explicitly look at your work. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether uh, part of the context that we're in right now, so Alex, Sarah, and I are working here in workshop uh, over there. And as I was just saying, there's this continuum happening between we had this paradigm of transfer learning, of supervision, and then we're sort of starting to slide into this paradigm of foundational models built on ever larger, self supervised, um, emergent property. And it strikes me a little bit as the work you're doing is still in that transfer learning space, whereas the one that the meta group is doing is in that sort of foundational model space. And the big question for all of us, of course, is, is it worth it, right? Is it worth the time and energy? God knows what the meta model plus the cost mm -hmm. to train. I think it was, you know, a, a 10 TPUs for two weeks or something. That could be, you know, $40,000, $50,000 per training time. And so have you looked at the difference in the models? Is, do you, is your sense that it was worth it? you know, for this massive effort? Um, it's definitely worth to explore it, right? Yeah. Um, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, someone should explore it to see if there is something to gain. Um, yeah, it's tricky. So what we, I think, what is a bit, the signal that we get from all this literature on self-supervised learning is that it really starts to lift off when you add more and more data. You need much more data than in a supervised problem. And, and only then you profit from the self-supervised learning. So now Earth observation actually has all this data, right? We have this huge petabytes, hard disks of, of 
data. So it is a good domain to explore that. But is, isn't there, there's two paradigms. There's like self-supervision with little data doesn't work at all. Yeah. But self-supervision with lots of data then can be maybe transferred to tasks with little data. Yeah. But once you have a lot of supervised data, then like my understanding is that lots of supervision oh. is still always better than lots of self-supervision. Yeah, yeah. So the question is with the Jedi signal that you have, which is now you've basically trained a large supervised model, is it actually better to do self-supervision than just a lot of supervision? Like when is the when is that are you hitting that boundary of like yeah, yeah, I definitely. think there the question is, okay, if you take this model now, is this just a specialist for vegetation structure height? Would that transfer easily to biodiversity or some completely different task? Oh, it might not. But is this model that's a specialist like way worse than something that was self-supervised to do lots of things? Or is it actually better, right? On that particular task? Mm -hmm. No, then I think if we have lots of supervision, then we should go for the supervision. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, it's so hard. I'm sorry that I don't no, I mean, have it, a it, better it, answer to that. It's a very unusual situation. Like, I'm looking at their paper right now. Okay. I'm, I'm, vaguely, I'm vaguely associated with it. I love an author, but they use some of my data. Yeah. And like, they have your figure. They have your data in a figure. It's figure seven. Yeah. And <laughs> right, they're trying to show how much better what they've done is than, than the model you think. And I'm wondering just, it sure it could be better, but relative to cost, relative to mm -hmm. effort, right? If it was just a few pixels and then you calculate it by cost and think about global carbon estimation and how <laughs> much, <laughs> right? Like yeah. if, I, they were contributing to global carbon <laughs> estimation at that point, right? Like, is it worthwhile? And that is such an unusual situation um, where you know there is two paradigms. Right? Yeah. Of course, we want to push forward, right? We want to get higher resolution because some tasks might only be solvable if we get like the one meter resolution kind of like others not. not. Yeah. And I mean, we one discussion that I, I had. Oh, excuse me. Oh, there was a mic on. Um, one discussion that I had with peers is that, um, yeah, like. But you're not planning to model this at 10. You're not planning to model carbon density at 10 meter resolution, right? Yeah. Like, why should we do that from an ecological perspective? Mm. Um, so technically, you could try to go for that, right? Um, but yeah, in the end, you need a domain expert that tells you if that is actually what they need to answer their scientific questions. And yeah, but overall, if we talk about these intermediate indicator variables like vegetation height that are only a means to do something else, providing a high resolution vegetation height map is probably more predictive for estimating biomass at one kilometer resolution than just a low resolution kind of lab map to estimate biomass at one kilometer resolution. So there, I think it's worth to go for higher resolution. But yeah, I mean, here we, it's, it's a lot of different things going on, right? Improving spatial resolution, different training procedure, et cetera. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll end the, the online seminar here. Mm -hmm. And thank you for all the online listeners. And thank you all for the listeners here, of course. Uh, we have a new seminar uh, next week. Johan Östman from AI Sweden will talk about federated learning in different applications such as life sciences, finance, and others. Uh, next environmental related talk we'll have is, is November 2nd, when we'll have Pia Donti, who's a, a chair of climate change AI and a professor at MIT. So, and your housemate. <laughs> awesome. Uh, awesome. Uh, so, uh, welcome back, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.